we'd like to welcome those who are just now joining us online. We're grateful that you're here with us as part of this time of worship with us on this day. And we want you to know that uh, our arms are open to receive you anytime you want to come online or especially as you come through our doors to share your worship with us. Uh, and we hope you can do that. Um, again, we welcome you to this time as we all worship together as one family of faith. Shall we turn in prayer as we prepare to consider God's holy word? Precious God, you have called us to be your people. You have sent us your Son, Jesus Christ, to show us how to live, to teach us your word, to die for us that we may continue eternally as your people. So help us, O oh God, through the power of your spirit. Help us, we pray, to be willing disciples, followers. In our Lord's name, amen. The Old Testament lesson today is Psalm 1, the very first of Psalms. I personally feel like this is an excellent psalm to be the leader, the number one in place psalm. It's a psalm I've known all my life, but I've memorized it, and yet now in this older age in which I have become somehow or another, it has taken on a deeper meaning. And I want to share, as we prepare to read part of this meaning, this beautiful psalm. The meaning is that it talks about the two extremes of humanity. Those people who would like a relationship and to carry on a relationship with Almighty God and their fellow man, and those people who reject that relationship with our Creator and loving God. So here now, and consider these words a scripture, Psalm 1. Blessed is the person who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law that person meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that it does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Let us now turn to the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. A prayer that he prayed near the end of his ministry on earth. It's in the, in, in the Gospel of John, in the 17th chapter. Now, let me put this in a little bit of context. Because John is a unique portion of the gospel. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very much alike in this particular event in the life of Jesus. John goes off on a slightly different path, a path that brings more conversation in to the relationship between Jesus and his apostles. So chapters 13 through the end of 16 talks about the events of the Last Supper. Now we call that the Lord's Supper on occasion. The Last Supper. Jesus coming together with his disciples for the Passover meal. The sacrament of the Lord's Supper springs from that particular meal. John picks up the conversation that Jesus and the disciples had after Jesus washed their feet and they had eaten. 
And I think it's wonderful to know that this was a conversation rather than a time of lecture. Go back if you would and read these several chapters from 13 through 1 through, through the end of chapter 16. And the disciples, as you will discover from time to time in this learning conversation, the disciples will raise questions and even on occasion give their own opinion for Jesus to follow up on. So it's truly a give and take learning event. It's not a preaching event. It's not a lecture event. It's more like a one-on-one -on -one personal event. And Jesus closed out, terminated, brought to the end of this conversation with a prayer. And that's what we want to think about in this time together. The first six verses of chapter 17, Jesus reports in a way in his prayer to Almighty God, to Heavenly Father. And officially, in a sense, I think, brings his ministry and his relationship with his disciples on earth to kind of an end with these 12 on earth to an end, ready to take the next step forward. So now what we will read from 6 to 19, verses 6 to 19, is Jesus is turning over the ministry he started <coughs> to the apostles, which will then, through the many, many centuries, come down to today's modern church. You and me and others like us who believe in our Lord Jesus Christ. So now here, the prayer, a portion of the prayer that Jesus prayed on that occasion. He prayed to God, of course, to God the Father. I have shown your name to the people who you have given me out of the world. Yours they were, and you have given them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given them is from you. For I have given them the words which you give to me. And they have received them, and they know in truth that I came from you, and that they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me. For they are yours. All mine are yours, and all that is yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth that your word is truth. As they as as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be consecrated in truth. Here ends the reading of scripture for today. May God continue to bless his holy word. And may his spirit continue to guide us as we strive to serve him. What will life be like for those who believe in Jesus Christ and strive seriously and humbly to follow our Lord Jesus and his teaching and his actions? It's a challenge 
for the followers of Jesus Christ in this world. And Jesus knew that full well, didn't he? You know, God bringing humanity to the height of creation that God promised to. You know, we are his highest form of creation. That's something special. God remained working with humanity to bring us even to a higher level. When God came to earth and walked the dusty roads with sweaty disciples, God in Jesus Christ was 100% flesh and blood. That substance of the earth, Jesus of Nazareth, born into the world as an infant in a dirty cradle, in a cattle barn, experienced life in a very humble way, didn't he? In a very challenging way. He had friends, trusted, trusted companions who double-crossed him right there at the end. He had people to make fun of him, even when he was dying on the cross for all of us. God in Jesus Christ, God in the man of Nazareth in the substance of humanity, knows full well what this life is like. You know, Jesus even had friends to die. And he even grieved their death. And he brought, for example, a couple of people, as the scriptures describe, some he didn't know, but one he knew especially, Lazarus, back from the dead, through Jesus' faith and trust in the heavenly Father. And in a sense, well, not so much as a sense, but in reality, when God the Father decides to bring individual human beings back from the grave, we will be of a different nature. We will not be of the substance of his earth. We will be the fullness of humanity through Jesus Christ, illustrated by his own resurrection and continuing ministry on earth and witnessed by hundreds of people, as the scriptures point out in several places. And that's what this prayer is ultimately about about God's understanding the substance of humanity and how unique followers of Jesus Christ are in this world. He has the substance of all humanity of this world. We have the substance of this world. And the uniqueness while believers and followers of Jesus Christ have that worldly substance, we are of a bit of a different nature. One day this world will end and our substance, our humanity substance, will be who knows what? The general nature of humanity will be gone. But God has already shown through Jesus Christ and his resurrection, that those who have willing to take on the nature, the relationship, the friendship, the mission of God's only Son will follow him into that life to come. We can't explain it on human terms. We have to move there in faith Faith 
and trust of the God who brought something out of nothing. And who is raising that something in such a manner that we intelligent human beings will never be able to explain. Sure, we'll explain bits and pieces of it. But it's beyond our full human comprehension. So what will life be like for believers and followers of Jesus Christ. It will be like a life of hope. But what we want to touch on today is that it will be a difficult life in the substance we have on earth. It will be difficult. It will be hard. It will be painful. It will be disappointing. And yet, in the faithfulness of God, our Creator, something about our nature as followers of Christ, Jesus, we can maintain contact with the one who is going to see us through it all. That's what this prayer of Jesus is. Jesus, the first six verses, is reporting into the Heavenly Father that, you know, I have done the mission up to this time that you sent me to do. I have gathered people together. I have taught them. And these apostles, these 12 people who follow me, plus some others, have been trained. And they have faith and confidence in you. Heavenly Father, and in the fact that you, Heavenly Father, have sent me to work with you. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Now, you were given a, an important task for a number of people who needed help. There could be several ways that that task, that mission, could be accomplished. And I'll just touch on three. There are hundreds of ways, probably, depending on who's doing it. Three, two, two or three basic ways in general. You're given a mission to help some people. One way you could do it is do it all yourself. Take the full responsibility for everything in order to help those people. A second way you can do that is to say, you know, I can't do all of this by myself. Let me sit back here in the office and I'll supervise these management style people and they will do the work for me as I sit here in comfort and make press releases. Two extreme ways. But there is a third way. And that third way is just as effective as these other ways, really, when you get down to it. Maybe even more effective in certain occasions. The third way is you, with all of the information and skills and abilities that are necessary for your job, you call some people together who are to receive the benefits, and you say, Let's work together on this. By doing that, you show respect and confidence in the benefactors of the gift, don't you? You trust them. You raise them to a higher level so that hopefully they will do additional work to help the project far beyond your time period. That's what God has done through Jesus Christ, His Son. God is pleased and joyous over humanity, all of humanity, 
regardless of who he was, God celebrates human beings. It says so in the Bible. We're created in the image of God. What a wonderful, fantastic measurement to be measured by. We're created in the image of God. And in that image, we can make decisions. We're smart people. People have always been smart ever since the days of Adam and Eve. Intelligent people. Growing, learning. We have learned from our education over the centuries. Over the eons. People have learned and built upon what the last generation learned. And that's what God wants. We're training and teaching each other. God could have instilled us to a point like he did horses and dogs and cats and let us be. And God could have been satisfied with that. But God, in the beginning, chose not to be satisfied that we would be like the other animals of his creation. And that is a part to be in his image. And so he brought humanity, I think, up to a particular level. And saw that the ancient peoples were just not fully responding in a relationship with him. That's what Psalm 1 is about. And so finally, at some point, the Heavenly Father, the Creator, decided to step, step in a little closer to humanity and to give us some more instructions and an example which he did in Jesus Christ. And our Lord Jesus trained and taught those early apostles and disciples and showed us and taught us even in the 21st century what God the Father expects of us and how we are to live. And in this prayer, Jesus points out to the reminds the heavenly Father, especially this prayer since John captured it. I think it's for us disciples too. The world has one substance. We are part of the world. The world has one nature. Sinfulness. We do too as part of that substance of the world, but we as followers of Jesus Christ and believers in him have an additional nature. One that will take us to that joyous eternal kingdom where we will forever maintain our relationship with our Creator. We sometimes call it the new creation. The new creation. The nature of the world is selfishness. The nature of the world is to do it my way and everybody else suffer. The nature of the world is to bicker and fuss and fight and feud with everybody who doesn't do things the way I want. The nature of our Heavenly Father is to stand by the sinful people who are willing to take a chance and follow the teachings of God's own Son, Jesus Christ. So the prayer that Jesus offers the Heavenly Father is to officially advise the Heavenly Father, I'm getting ready to be crucified now and to die the life of this substance earth. Bring on your Holy Spirit to be with your people and to continue guiding them. Bring on your Holy Spirit for the life of the believers of Jesus Christ 
as we are the church. As we are the church. With the substance of this world, like I mentioned earlier, the substance of this world, we've got, you know, molecules and atoms and spider webs and all that stuff around. I don't see the spider webs. <laughs> <laughs> we have the substance, the church has the substance of the world. We can, you know, even our own Presbyterian church, as you have heard and read about, I suspect, over the last few years, there's some bickering, there's some uncertainties. And yet, as you and you know, and then you consider that there are X number of the different denominations, and then there's some individual churches who choose to be on their own existence without being in an official denomination. That's the human nature of us. That's the worldly substance of us. And yet, even with this imperfect worldly substance, Believers in the Lord Jesus Christ are multiplying and growing around the world. And the church has been doing that for 2,000 years. And people in other parts of the world, some people are even giving their lives because their governments or their national religion does not agree with Christianity, so they go out and kill the Christians, even the boys and girls, and children and babies. You hear about it from time to time in our world in these countries. We have a hard life, don't we? Life for the believer. God, our Creator, knows and understands that life through Jesus Christ. So this prayer of Jesus, let us rest assured that as we believers train and teach the next generation, let us rest assured that our Heavenly Father is with us and that our Heavenly Father and His Son and the Holy Spirit will be with the next generation and the next generation and the next generation even though they remain in this world of this world of substance. And we of this world of substance will have that additional nature of eternal hope that the world does not have. So let us share our faith even in these difficult, painful times. Knowing that somehow we believers in Jesus Christ are growing as human beings. We are growing to be of the nature that God wants us ultimately to be. The gift of love, the gift of life, a gift of God present in His world. Keeping this truth safe as we strive to grow to that nature that God, the Creator, would have us to be. Let's turn in.